Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medicamentum Authentica. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. I have uh, two very interesting guests today that I'm going to talk about here, and these are the two sons of Dr. Harvey Bigelson, uh, who wrote this book, Holographic Blood, among others, and was a real pioneer in integrating uh, terrain theory into modern medical practice, and we're going to focus a little bit about on that today. So we have Adam and Josh Bigelson here with us who are carrying on uh, their father's legacy and are very devoted to this um, change in the healthcare paradigm. So it's great to have you guys. Welcome. Well, Thank you. To be here. Thanks for having great. us. Great to be here. So um, Adam, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about your father's story. And, and Josh, feel free to weigh in. I mean, I know you guys are brothers, so you have your own chemistry about how you tell a story together, right? Sure. We'll, we'll interrupt okay. each other the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've choreographed this already. Um, cool. Yeah, dad's story, dad's story is amazing. It's really an interesting story. He, his mind was brilliant. Um, at the age of seven, you know, as a Jewish person, Jewish man growing up in Brooklyn, New York, his choices were to become a doctor or a lawyer. And he told grandma, he said, I want to be a doctor and I'm going to cure cancer. And she said, you can't do that. And he said, doctors do that. So he's seven years old and wanted to cure cancer. It's amazing that he ended up working with cancer. Um, he went on into school, and in fourth grade, they gave him a math test, an assessment test, to see what math class to place him in. They said, do the test on 44. He did the test on 444, like at the end of the book. He got 100% and did not show any work. So, of course, he was accused of cheating. The teachers gave him another test, and he got 100% without showing any work. He has a math mind that was amazing. Uh, my brother, Josh, my sister, Lila, and I all cried as children with my father, our father, trying to help us with our math homework. Didn't get I'll tell you, like, that, this reminds me of a story in college uh, at MIT when uh, one of a uh, uh, guy I knew, he, he also knew the answer on a test, and it was a very difficult uh, problem, and he just writes on the exam, by trivial mathematics, the answer is... <laughs> <laughs> nice. so he, got, he got called into the professor's office. <laughs> nice after that but uh, they didn't accuse him of cheating they just wanted to know how he got the answer and i guess he did a good enough job explaining that they gave him credit but uh <laughs> nice nice yeah, but certain people's brains process differently yeah totally and that's our dad he looked at math as a language so his brain was different definitely um he went on to medical school and wanted to be an eye surgeon he got drafted to vietnam and he was a trauma surgeon in Vietnam. He was head of mass casualties because eyes come last. So when the helicopters came in, our father was the one who decided who could be helped and who couldn't. So he decided basically who lived and who died. And his hospital had a 98% survival rate during this war. So when he came back to the United States, he uh, didn't see the hospitals. Brilliant hospital. <laughs> well, yeah, he yeah. came back to the States and he didn't see the hospitals in the States getting these results. So he knew something wasn't quite right. Um, you know, he did his life though. He was a rich eye surgeon. He had all the money he wanted and he wasn't happy. Um, at one point, someone came into him for a consultation and asked his expert opinion. So of course he recommended the surgeries like he was taught. Um, but the patient said, I have something else I'm gonna try this natural way. And she went somewhere else. Um, and Josh, if you want to pick this up here right on that one, because you tell me it's better. Yeah, so she went to some you know, alternative witch doctor and the person did a retro bulbar injection, so they actually pushed the eyeball to the side and they injected procaine and homeopathics into the back there, and they fixed the case. So my dad went and learned this technique. A few, a few months later, somebody comes in, the same exact issue going on, so he gets excited, you know, he, he does the treatment, fixes the case. And the client was so excited, she'd been to six different doctors and none of them could help her. So she went to all six of those doctors and, and told them what my father did, and all six of the doctors reported him to the medical board. Wow, no good deed goes unpunished. He was had charges brought against him one time for curing somebody illegally. Yes. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't care that the cancer was cured. They cared that he did not do it legally using their methods. Yeah, well, I found some really strange uh, rules about, about things. Um, just in, in my recent um, you know, work, uh, not necessarily that I've been in any trouble, thankfully, not yet. But, um, you know, like... There was a client who uh, had watched my detox video and wanted to get some food grade bentonite clay, and they were in Canada. So they went to a health food store and didn't see it on the shelf. So they asked someone, and the manager came over and said, 
you're not it's not legal to ingest bentonite clay in canada oh really yeah interesting they have been doing it for thousands of years, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean. It's a fine line between clever and stupid. Um, yeah. So, well, and with our father was interesting, too, because when he was in medical school, you know, what he said was the first year he was taught what a normal body was, the second year what an abnormal body was, but he was never taught how one became the other. And he would ask questions, and they would tell him to read the book. And at one point, he said, I think the book is wrong. So, you know, in Vietnam, he saw the lies the government was telling people. In medical school, he wasn't getting the answers he expected. So he questions his government. He questions his education. And then he's doing things like Josh said, like he's finding ways to help people, and he's getting in trouble for it. So at one point, our mother went to see a psychic. And dad's not into this at all. He's like, whatever, mom, you know, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> so she goes to see a psychic, and the first thing the psychic says is, I need to meet your husband. We need to talk. So, okay, dad, whatever, he goes to meet the psychic, and the psychic introduces him to the work of Edgar Casey. And this psychic, actually, you won't find this written anywhere, but this psychic was psychic to four presidents. One time when my father was with him, our father, he was called out to go to Camp David with Jimmy Carter. <laughs> okay? So this, yeah, this was an interesting person. And we've been to different psychics, and some of them are interesting. Uh, some of them are pretty, pretty right on, depending on what goes on. But dad learned about Edgar Casey, and he learned about the medical readings. Do you know about Edgar Casey and what he did? Very little bit, yes. Okay. He would go into, they called him a sleeping prophet. So basically, he would go to, he, his wife would ask him a question that was sent to him, a medical question, and he would go to sleep, and he would go into this trance, and he would just start talking. And he would recommend all this, all this alternative medicine to do. And he'd wake up, and he'd have no recollection of it, and his results were amazing. Like, so people would come from all over the world to see the sleeping prophet, basically. So the famous people. He had somebody like recording what he was saying in his sleep. Yeah. He, yeah. He would, he would talk and his wife would write it down. Wow. Basically. So, so dad is, dad's really left brain, you know, <laughs> but so he goes and he starts studying all of Edgar Casey's medical readings. And the things he picked up is the thing he recommended almost every time was osteopathic work. He would always recommend osteopathic work. He talked about the structure of the body is so important. So dad started incorporating osteopaths into his practice, and then his, his, his uh, results really started to skyrocket. And as you have people who are working on the body, but if they're not aligning the, the car, it doesn't matter what you put into it. So right. you can go to your homeopath, they're giving you herbs. You know, you go to the traditional people, maybe they're giving you pharmaceuticals, but nobody's taking time to actually align the car. So with that, whatever treatment he did, he always made sure the car was aligned properly because then it'll start to drive straight. So it really... It made a big difference. Made a big difference. Yeah. What did that entail from him? Well, um, yep. Go ahead. I was going to say it was uh, interesting because, you know, he's, he wanted to be a scientist. So for him, he's working with different cases. Um, he's got his Western medical background, the germ theory experience, and he's learning about homeopathics and holistic medicine. And we were in Arizona in the late 70s. So at this point, anyone could call themselves a homeopath. Like there was no regulation and all that stuff. But as a scientist, reading the Edgar Casey experience, he experimented. So with his cases, he would do different things, and then he would incorporate the body work, the osteopathic work. And then all of a sudden, he noticed results were really changing. So you know, for him, uh, he would do things with scars. And for us, we see scars. There, it's tissue that is constricted, it's contracting, and it can actually pull the body out of alignment. So our dad would do things with scar therapy to release the scars, and then the body work to help align the body and actually put it back into parasympathetic mode after the scar treatment it and made a big difference because with, with neural therapy there's a lot of people out there doing it it's called neural therapy and they'll inject procaine and, and homeopathics into scar tissue um but you know as soon as the needle goes into your body the body goes what the hell are you doing to me and it goes right into sympathetic mode right so he would always do it with the, with the osteopath there so we do the injections and the osteopath would do the body work immediately and take the body from para, from sympathetic into parasympathetic so that it could heal so it made, it made a big, big difference. So we've seen people over the years doing neural therapy and injecting the body, and the person leaves in the state of what the hell was that all about? Right. You know, and they, they leave in sympathetic mode. So. Yeah. yeah well, I was if you could mix the um, homeopathic herbs with DMSO instead of using an injection. Mm -hmm. There's things we're experimenting with now, actually, um, and that's our goal, because as we're doing injections, we need doctors. And our goal is really to educate and empower people so they can learn to take charge of their own health care. We started to do a little work with essential oils, um, with lasers, 
with sound and vibration. The thing is, we haven't been working with a clinic in such a long time, so we haven't had the, um, the subjects, basically, to run through with the blood. So now that we're starting to work again with the clinic in Mexico, we're about to really have some, some data coming in to really check on these things. Well, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about this clinic in Mexico. Ah, okay. Clinic in Mexico. Right now, uh, this is where I'm at. I'm in Tijuana. I just moved myself to Rosarito. I'm excited. And for those of you listening, um, the news, once you cross the border, is very different. But just to let you know, not that I want to get into any of this too much, but in Tijuana, there are 4 million people and there are 100 cases of COVID. The border has never been closed in over 100 years, except for six hours during 9-11. So whatever you're hearing as far as Mexico is going crazy with COVID, not true. I'm here now, and that's the reality, okay? Um, there's actually a doctor working with the clinic that's interested in our insight on the COVID experience. Uh, I'm thrilled. So the clinic in Mexico, my, our father was here in the 90s working with doctors in Mexico. There was a point in time where he kept getting persecuted. He said, to hell with this. I'm leaving the States. I'm going to Mexico. And Mexico is very supportive because of the medical tourism. Right. And especially once Obamacare happened. But when dad came to Mexico in the 90s, he worked with doctors that allowed him to use low dose targeted radiation with his cancer patients while he supported the body naturally. In the 90s, low dose targeted radiation was illegal in the United States. They want to radiate your whole body. Right. Not toxic enough. Right. right. And, as, and as far as what you know, doing you know, your investigations, if the, if the cancer dies and you die also, but the cancer dies first, that's a clinical success. Right. Your death was a side effect. Uh, well, it's the theory behind the chemo is the opa kills the cancer before it kills the person. Right. <laughs> and, and, and what he learned is there was ways to protect the body from the chemotherapy. So all the chemo could do was go after the, the cancer. So he would do lots of uh, hyperbaric chambers. Uh, he would do a lot of ozone work. He used a lot of cell therapy, uh, animal proteins, because that's legal outside of the United States and protects certain parts of the body. So all the chemo could really do was go after the cancer itself. So the people, you know, they'd feel pretty good for the process. They wouldn't lose their hair. Um, and it was a much more pleasant way to go through the actual process. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm familiar with some various techniques to do that. And it, it is, I mean, you know, I wouldn't advise anyone to go through with that type of treatment at all, but certainly it could be a lot better tolerated and a lot better chance of success uh, going this route. Sure, yeah. definitely. And the thing is, you know, dad was here in the 90s. They were very supportive. Um, people were coming here. He was getting results. He was getting amazing results, so much so that the head of a very famous school in the United States that I won't mention, the head of the hematology department came to visit him in Mexico because of his cancer results. So dad put some blood under the microscope that was live, and the man refused to look in the microscope because the blood was not stained. And my father said, our father said to him, you came here for my results. And the reason I get the results is in that microscope. And he would not look. Wow. This is a man who's in charge of teaching people. You know, this is a, a major point that I've made several times. And it, it really, you know, it defies logic because in the biological sciences and especially in the medical sciences, right? Whenever we look at tissue under the microscope, it's always dead. We can never, you know, it's like, how do you study an organism when they're not alive? You can't observe the behavior and the function, yeah. right? So yeah. it's, uh, it's really unfortunate that this, uh, you know, physician scientist was um, so <laughs> resistant to that idea. I mean, I I'm sure that he realized that if he did look at it, he wouldn't be able to go back to what he was doing. Right. Yeah. That's, that's why he didn't want to, you know, make a major life change right in that moment. Yeah, he, he knew better. He probably would have gotten attacked and lost his job, you know, um, which is too bad. The reality is dad wanted to help people. He was rich. He was an eye surgeon. He had all the money he wanted, and he was not happy. And he taught us the difference between being rich and living rich. When dad started to help people, he was excited. I remember as a kid, he would come home from work so excited. This person came in with this, and I was reading the Kate Edgar's cases, and this happened, and we tried this, and this happened. He was so excited. And the people that he worked with, I mean... Um, he found one German doctor on an Indian reservation when I got really sick. And the guy had a microscope, just like Naysan's. Naysan's was the first microscope dad ever looked into. And the story with Naysan's is awesome. Dad saw these little things in the blood moving around. He said he'd never seen live blood. He got chills. He needed to learn. And there were these little things, microscopic things that we call symbionts. They're called microzymos, bions, 
right. super tights. There are many names for them, but what's that? Somatids. Somatids. Mm -hmm. Many names, but none in Western medicine. Western medicine says fat particles. So Gaston Maison's isolated one injected it into a dead rat muscle, and 30 years later, that muscle is alive in a jar. This is pure life. These little things are existing in plants, animals, minerals, limestone, millions of years old, they found them. So dad studied these things with the microscope. And what he learned was health is simple. People are complicated. <laughs> he said, and now we sometimes make... practitioners really complicate things. <laughs> yes. yes. So I want to see that on a meme, though. That's uh, such a wisdom pearl. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that'd be a good one to do. The thing is, it really was that simple. But what he did was he did not treat the disease or the issue. He treated the person. And the body is always striving for balance. Even if things are going the wrong direction, the body is trying to help you. So the question is, where are the blocks? And the microscope was what he saw that showed where the blocks were. And the story with that is funny too. He had, he had me with the German doctor. Um, I had mono so bad I was showing minor signs of hepatitis. I was supposed to go to college in six days. German guy comes into the office. Uh, ironically, he flew in the Luftwaffe. He flew in Hitler's Air Force. So you have the Jewish doctor and the ex-Nazi working together. Um, he took some blood from me, put it in this huge syringe with some remedies, had me hold it in my hand and think happy thoughts. He shot it with a laser, um, huge needle. I remember I couldn't breathe. I just wanted someone to cut a hole in my throat, but huge needle, say ah, ex-Nazi, dad, um, yeah, surreal. So he injects my tonsils, puts the rest of the remedy into my butt and says to my dad, he'll be fine, he can go to college. The next day, my white self count was down. The swelling had gone down. Four days later, I went off to college and my dad said to the German doctor, you're going to come work in my office. <laughs> so he brought him in and all of a sudden, Farrah Fawcett's coming in and Ryan O'Neill and Angie Dickinson because they follow this guy. They know him. I see, yeah. They would go to him when the award ceremonies would come around and he would do rejuvenation and regenerative therapies to make them look pretty and young. So dad knew something was going on here and he tried to learn as much as possible. This is Dr. Friedrich Plogue. Now, Dr. Plogue was kind of quiet about the whole thing, but dad would study his cases. And eventually the Berlin Wall came down and Dr. Plogue went back to Germany to find his family. So dad's lost. And we don't believe in coincidences. In the door walks this four foot five German woman with big red hair, a long black cape, a diamond encrusted cigarette holder, high heels, walks into the office and says, I am here. <laughs> We don't know this person. We have no idea who this person is. So this is Dr. Silke Friedrich. She has the microscope and she starts to work with dad. And one client comes in. It's funny. Dad's, the client's in the middle, Silke on one side, dad on the other side. Dad's guessing. He doesn't know what's going on. He has no so idea what he's seeing in the microscope. So yeah, he's she's looking, over there coaching him. <laughs> yeah, she's coaching him. So he would say, do you have any stomach problems? And she would kind of shake her head. Uh, this, no, shake her head. This, then she'd kind of tug her ear and say yes. At one point, she says to the patient, when did you break your arm? The client says, I didn't tell you I broke my arm. How did you, did you, did you know that? So, you know, dad says to the client, I, I need to excuse us. I need to speak with <laughs> Dr. Friedrich. And he says, how the hell did you know this? And she points in the microscope. And he looks in the microscope and there's an image that looks like a broken arm. Now, he doesn't believe this. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a numbers guy. He's a right brain guy, you know. Left so, brain. Left brain, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Long day. So he, she does this in his office for about a year, over and over. What she's seeing in the blood are the root, the true root causes of people's issues. And eventually, he gets it. And he embraces it, and everything starts to change. And what Josh talks about, structure of the body, dad said he didn't learn very much about structure in medical school. And as Josh said, you can put all the good gas in your car you want and all the oil changes. If it's out of alignment, it's going to keep driving off center. Your structure is the framework for your energetic flow. If you have a river and things are flowing and a tree falls on the edge of the river, an eddy forms and debris accumulates. In the body, if the structure is out of alignment, the same thing can happen. So we have seen so many people come to us. They've been around the world. No one can figure out anything that's going on with them. When that happens, we're thrilled because most of the time, it's the structure of the body. 
people coming to us with heart issues, call the heart specialists. We look at the blood. We do not see any heart in the blood, nothing that indicates that. We see structural issues. We send them to an osteopath who aligns the body, takes pressure off the organ. The heart issue goes away. That's the great thing, actually, what I like about traditional medicine is their lab tests. If there's something bad, they're going to find, they're going to find it. So we definitely incorporate those tests into what we do. But it's always nice. When they can't figure out what it is, it's almost always structural. They're just, they're just not paying attention to the alignment of the car. And at that point, you know the case is going to be fairly simple. Right. And Dad always said, it's not, he said, don't call me alternative, because that word means I'm secondary. But he was not alternative. He was not mainstream. He used both. He was integrative. You know, so he's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Trauma surgeons are awesome. The um, paramedics are wonderful. The nurses are great. He said when the doctors get a chance to use their brain, then things get a little weird. And the specialists, he also said, are part of the issue. Dad was a left, left eye surgeon. Yeah. So some other guy worked on the other eye. They're, they're connected somehow. You know, there could be an eye issue that somehow is related to the structure of the head. So dad said, it's kind of like they're missing the forest through the trees. It's a holistic experience. The head bone's connected to the knee bone. You can fall on your butt and get a headache. We've and actually I've, seen, go ahead, Josh. I've literally looked at, I don't know, thousands and thousands of blood slides. And I've never seen the root cause be bacteria, be a virus, be your candida. <laughs> right, right. You know, there's, there's always usually a structural issue that's going in there that's usually set up emotionally. So the emotions happen, and then it's, it's followed up by um, a physical event, whether it's an injury, whether it's a surgery or something like that. And then that traumatic emotion gets physically locked into the body. So you start to work on the body physically, and then it helps to release the emotion as well. Um, but this is, I guess, where we can phase into pleomorphism a bit. Um, so we can touch on a little bit about what pleomorphism is. So you've been... You've been dabbling in it, Dr. Kaufman? <laughs> well, I mean, I've been uh, studying a little bit. I, I, you know, I didn't actually even realize it at the time, but when I started studying natural healing uh, methods, I didn't really have a theory that it was based on because I was sort of listening to different practitioners who were successful talking about things, and they didn't necessarily have a theoretical orientation. But at some point, I realized that it's all really terrain theory based. Because that's exactly what we're doing is adjusting the, you know, microenvironment or the ecology of the body, right, to allow the body to heal itself, um, and whatever impediments are in the way. And I haven't addressed the structural issues yet. I want to definitely learn more about that. But, you know, I did also realize that there's always more than one approach that could be successful for any given person, right? So that yes. when I hear about other people being successful and they're doing things so differently than I would recommend, I kind of get excited because I'm like, oh, then I can learn some new things to add to my arsenal, right? That's the way. Uh, yes, perfect. Uh, you know, and that's how it works. And, and I also, I think it's quite fascinating. You guys mentioned a couple of examples of this, how uh, very prominent, wealthy, famous, and important, you know, so-called important people tend to come to folks like us. Oh, yeah. Doing a very different thing because we actually kind of are closest to the truth about yeah. health right yes. and have good results and you know even the queen of england um and the royal family right they get uh treated from a homeopath <laughs> one of our yeah. one of our students does the blood for one of them there you go right <laughs> yes so, yeah. so you know for you doubters out there you know just ask yourself why would these people with unlimited resources uh be looking to meet their own family's health needs with these kind of techniques if this is not uh, you know, the best, um, the best quality type of approach that's out there. And even even Rock Rockefeller died with never taken a pharmaceutical in his life and had to live in homeopath with him. There you he go. He was a businessman. <laughs> he was a businessman and it's a great business. And that's the problem. We're a threat to the business. And for people listening too, you know, our dad did this for almost 40 years. We have uh, almost 60,000 images of blood in our database. So when we say what we say, this is not what we think. This is what we know from repeated experience. Josh and I were in Spain lecturing and we got on stage with, as a round table with a bunch of doctors and politicians and lawyers and scientists. And we had the translator in our ear and someone said, we need to be scientists like the Biggelsons. And I said, did he just call us scientists? But he said, we came up with a method and we saw patterns and it's replicable. Now what's interesting is everyone is different. So you got 10 different prostate cancers with 10 different causes, okay? Everyone is an individual. There are a lot of commonalities, 
Dad had Lyme disease cases at the end of his last book, Doctors Are More Harmful Than Germs. 96 cases with 96 different causes. There is no one cure for cancer. There is no one cure. You really have to understand the holistic experience. And what comes down to for us is Rudolf Steiner's four bodies. The physical body, the energetic, the emotional, and the spiritual. If you have a physical issue, it's going to affect your energy, your emotions, and you might question a higher power. If you've got an energetic issue, physically you get weak, emotionally you get weak, and maybe you question a higher power. Emotional issues? Are you kidding? We're emotional beings. Doctors, none of them really ask or care. When Josh has a client come in that had something going on in their life, that he, they have cancer, they have something horrible, and he asks them, what was going on in your life a year or two before this happened? Most people start to cry. The emotions set them up. Right. I, I mean, this is, this is a, maybe the only advantage I have from my psychiatric experiences, you know, being able to uh, allow people to get at that stuff and having like a, a sense of when there's a major emotional issue there so that I can give the person space and time to allow them to articulate it because these things are very, you know, difficult. And many, many times, you know, they tell, I say, well, you know, have you told anyone else about this? And, you know, no, kept it to themselves sometimes for decades. Sure. Yeah, um, sure. But getting back to, uh, I want to get into pleomorphism a little bit. We started to go that way. And, yes. you know, the viewers out there that um, are really, this is a brand new thing to them. We talked about like all the different names for these little particles, but could you give a little bit of a kind of a basic explanation of what you're looking at under the microscope with these structures and, you know, what exactly it is, and then we can get into some more advanced sure. uh, topics. If we, if we can do a quick screen share. I might have a video there. Yes, um, but yeah, basically when we look in the microscope, you'll see these little particles just dancing around and they'll yeah. come in different shapes. You know, they're all these tiny little dots, basically. I guess that's the scientific term, tiny little dots. Um, and what happens is as our body starts to stagnate, you know, the body's supposed to flow like a nice river. And the river is always nice and fresh, good oxygen. But we get some blocks in the, in the river, and then we have a, we have a pond. Right. And the body starts to stagnate, right? And when that happens, our pHs will start to change. And when our pHs start to change, the little, the little somatids, the symbionts, the particles, they change also. So it starts to change. This is pleomorphism. They start to morph into bacteria. And, and hold that thought real quick. Um, yep. Dr. Kaufman, it says that host disabled. If you can uh, enable screen share yeah. on my end, I'll, I'll bring up the picture so Josh can address the picture too. Yeah, and pleomorphism is scientifically accepted. So this is not something that's, you know, random here. Uh, and they talked about the studies that passed door that nobody's ever been able to recreate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's pleomorphism, Josh, if you can see that. Okay, so we start, number one is somatids. So those are the particles we see. Like Adam said, a lot of names for them, somatids, sympertides, bions, endobions. We've been using um, symbionts because it translates to Spanish easier, symbiontes. <laughs> um, but uh, somatids is fine. So, and these so particles, uh, they, uh, typically we see them either inside or coming out of red blood cells. Um, we'll see them, yeah, we'll see them basically around the red blood cells. On occasion, you'll see them inside a red blood cell because they're actually help us with our decomposition as well. Oops. Those little guys moving around. Mm -hmm. And do they take up residence in other cell types as well, or is this more specific for the blood? It's a good question because we're kind of regulated to this very basic microscope that we've been using. Nasan's microscope, you know, went 3,000 times deeper than kind of our microscope does. So there's probably more that we can see in there. Yeah. Um, but for us, you know, they're part of everything is, how would I say it? I think they create everything. Yes. They create the bacteria, which can then create a fungus from the bacteria. Um, platelets are found to have, um, symbionts in them, somatism as well. So fibrin has, has, has shown to have that as well. So it's, it's hard to put it into perspective how important I think they are. It's basically pure life. It's like your chi. It's yeah. your life force. It's, it's your prana. Yeah, these right? they morph into, into, the, into everything, basically. Dad said they help create it, who we are, and they help us to decompose. Yeah. Right. So just for yeah. looking at this slide, what we're seeing here is that these larger circles that are sort of purplish are the red blood cells. Yes. Um, and there are a few bigger white blood cells. Um, you get it. They look like neutrophils. 
um, in there where the cursor is. And then you have these uh, tiny little shiny dots that are moving around. And those are the objects or symbionts that we're, that we're talking about here. Yes. yes. These guys are the platelets over here. Cool. So as Josh said, with the pleomorphism experience, those little guys will morph and change based on the terrain. And, and they'll morph, yeah, go. basically as they go into a bacteria, the bacteria then are created to clean up the, the soil. So I always look at bacteria like it's the body's vacuum cleaner. They're there to clean up all the garbage, right? So it's there to help you. Um, if we don't fix the stagnation, the pH is continue to change and the bacteria turns into a fungus. So the body starts to mold. And that's the way my dad always viewed cancer was that cancer was a mold. Yes. Now you, you can cut the, you know, you get some mold on some cream cheese, you can cut that mold off, but the next day you got 10 spots of mold because the cream cheese is still ready to actually, the, the cream cheese is still rotten. So he always says you make the body so strong that it can't mold. Now the beauty of pleomorphism is that it can be reversed. Yes. So as you start to work on the blocks, the pond becomes a river again, the pH is balanced out, the fungus goes into a bacteria and that changes back into a healthy little somatid. So it's this beautiful, beautiful symbiosis that goes on in, in the body. So just to make sure that I understand completely, so what you're saying is that there's some insult to the body that starts off a disease, right? And it could be an emotional insult, it could be uh, exposure to a toxin, it could be malnutrition, it could be a physical injury, right? And that then starts changing the, in the terrain. And one of the things that happens, I believe that the, the pH becomes more acidic, Yes. right? Is uh, in the disease state. And so that will then through some kind of signal mechanism, right, trigger uh, the symbionts to start changing shape and differentiating into the, the most appropriate microorganism to clean that mess up. Yes. Right. Right. Um, in a sort of saprophytic role, like in nature, right, where it decomposes dead tissue or, or debris. And then if this, that system is overwhelmed for some reason, like the, the primary cause of the illness is continuing to uh, go on and not resolve, for example, mm -hmm. then it gets into this more chronic state, the pH will become more acidic. And that's when the um, organisms further change shape into the yeast or mold form. Yes. That's what you're saying into a chronic uh, disease condition. You got it. Exactly. And, and it's, it's interesting because dad was really, he was known for his cancer work. <laughs> and, you know, you have a lot of people hearing, oh, alkaline good, acidity bad, basically. It is Nobody really knows what they're doing a lot of times with it. But everybody's changing their diet to go more alkaline based. They're drinking alkaline water. Um, all of my dad's cancer cases had highly alkaline blood. All right. Yeah. Now, our blood is supposed to be what? Slightly on the alkaline side. Right. Every single one of his cancer cases had a, a pH that was 75, 7.55 or higher. So, right? and this is what yeah. for. Yes. And, right, they would call that an alkalosis in, the, in medicine. Yeah. Right. So, we see people, a lot of people don't understand that this is the blood pH we're talking about. Mm -hmm. People are take, taking their urine and testing their urine, but what they're doing is testing their waste product. Right? So if your blood is alkaline, it's going to clean up the, the garbage and your urine is going to be acidic. So people, people are testing their, their little pH strips and saying, oh, I'm acidic, I have to, you know, alkaline water and things like that. But no, basically every single one of his cases was highly, highly alkaline. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, the, so you're saying that the pH can uh, go either way in, in disease? Well, there's, there's saliva pH, there's urine pH, there's blood pH. Right. Well, so I, I mean, I, right. this is something that is a point of confusion that comes up uh, with my clients and audience all the time, right? Because yes. the alkaline water thing and uh, the yes. pH stomach is very different from your blood. So I usually yeah. think about the blood pH when we're talking about acidity associated with disease. So what you're telling me about, you know, alkaline blood pH and cancer is a little bit uh, news to me. Yeah. Yeah. And we even, it was nice because we, we, you know, we called now that our father is no longer with us, unfortunately. And these are the things we've been preaching for years, but now we can't ask him those questions anymore. So we've got a wonderful cancer doctor in Mexico, and we called just to confirm it. You know, he's, you know, and he said, yep, all of his cancer cases are highly alkaline. Um, so, you know, people talk about the blood, but what over what is half your blood is made up of plasma. So I always look at like the plasma is the river and the red cells are flowing in the river. So if they're eliminating waste for the plasma, it's going to affect the red cells. So the fact that the red cells become, you know, could become acidic makes sense. But it's the river itself that's alkaline causing the issue. 
Right. So when dad worked on these cases, cancer specifically, anytime he got that pH under seven, three, around 7.35, the cancer would die all over the body. Right. But yeah, you can, go, you can go different ways. They, when they, they analyzed the Egyptian sarcophagus, sarcophagi, and they found that the body can decompose three natural ways, or three ways. They found one of those ways was cancer, which we would view as a mold. Uh, one of those ways was a circulatory death, um, circulation issues, and one of them was arthritic. And arthritic was just natural causes, basically. This is, you know, the, the body gets rusty. Worn out. Right. Yeah. So when we look at the blood, we watch the way the cells decompose, and it tells us different directions that they're going. For us, I, we don't really care whether the blood is highly alkaline or highly acidic. It's, it's out of balance. Right. So we have to figure out why it's, why it's out of balance. So for us, the diagnosis really didn't make a difference. you got to find out why, and then the body balances out on its own. Right. Well, one thing that I would, I would be really curious about, and you guys may not know the answer to this, but there's a doctor in Italy who uses um, intravenous uh, so bicarbonate as oh, yes. a from cancer, and it's very successful, right? And that will actually alkalinize your blood further. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, because that's been around for a long time, and it's really interesting. Um, the, the question would be, because that would change the pHs, um, but I would think it would change it temporarily. Right. So I would still think you'd have to figure out why, and I'm all for a Band-Aid while you're fixing the case. Right, right. You and know, that's what Dad did. Though. Dad, as we worked with doctors to get rid of cancer, that's one thing. But we could figure out why you got it and then make sure that it didn't come back. But right. you got to be a part of the whole experience too. You know, it's a mold. Josh talks about the pH. And what affects our pH more than anything, what we found is not diet. It's attitude. Really? Yes, dad worked uh, with a guy, a doctor, that put a pH meter in someone's arm and would come in and say, the results of the test do not look good, and the pH would spike. He would say, oh, actually, things are okay, and the pH would go down. Stress and the acidity of the body is huge. Okay, right now, as I'm in Mexico, which has some really low cancer rates in the world, and you can look online, and the cancer rates in the States, ridiculous. High, so high. Well, what's the difference between Mexico and the States? Well, Mexico is a little more relaxed in general. A lot of things happen mañana. And in the States, it's, it's, we're moving, we're shaking, we're stressing, we're doing stuff, stuff, and we don't have time to relax. We're eating in the car. Stress yeah. attitude has a lot to do with cancer. And, the belief, and, and it's our... Yep, sorry. Um, the, say, the, kidneys, the kidneys and lungs control the majority of our pH. You know, diet contributes a very... I think they said anywhere from 2 to 5% of our pH is diet. And of course, if you eat McDonald's, it's probably going to be worse than that. Um, but the kidneys and lungs are really what kind of controls the pH. And we always look at uh, Eastern philosophy and the emotions behind each organ. So kidneys have to do with fear and lungs have to do with grief or sadness. You know, and most of the people here in the United States, we're either afraid of something or we're mourning over something. You yeah. know, so just that's going to affect our pHs. Mm -hmm. And anger, so many of my dad's or his liver cancer patients were angry people. And if you can't let go of that, then there's only so much we can do. There's your belief experience. Right. You know, there's something you did. You did this. You got here all by yourself. So we can support you, but you need to, you are part of the problem. You need to be a part of the solution. People would come to dad and say, fix me, doc. And he would say, I don't fix anybody. I can support your body. And it does amazing things. Right. right. You know, he this says, is the only one you get. Yeah, this is, you know, it's very difficult for people to, you know, people without experience working in this space to understand that it's a totally different way of working with someone, right? Like, I don't, uh, you know, like, that's the, the biggest part is, right, that uh, I'm not, I'm not able to fix anyone, right? I, I just provide information. And then you have to, you have to do the work to fix yourself, right? Because it's something that you did that caused it. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, intentional probably. Uh, yeah, right. Although it might be, but <laughs> but um, possibly. But, but it's up. It's up to you to do that. And so it's a. It's a. You know. So their experience is so different because it's not passive. It's active, and mm -hmm. not dependent. Right. Like it, especially in psychiatry, but really this is the goal in all of the allopathic systems is that they want you to be a customer for life. Yes. Right? And they want you to take as many pills as possible for life, right? Because each month, then there's more revenue coming in. Yes. And, um, you know, and psychiatrists and psychologists like psychotherapists, I mean, they, you know, like you get someone who shows up for their appointments and they have the right insurance. You like, you want to see them every week and there's, you're not, but you're not actually yeah. doing anything to contribute. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, so, you know, 
if people come in, they do this. It's a short term thing. If they want to, if they're willing to take action to address these issues, right? Um, and then they map out a path, and maybe there's some stumbling blocks and they need some extra help along the way. But essentially, if they actually carry that out, then on the other side, right? You, then you're, you're rebalanced and you have your health again. And you, you, you know, then you don't need to go and then follow up and get things checked and monitor all the time, right? Yes. It's, that's it. It's uh, yeah. now kind of thing. They did, yeah. they did studies yeah. on people who live to be over a hundred years old. One of the commonalities is they don't go for regular checkups because mm -hmm. the doctor will find something wrong with you. And with dad's clinics, we would be booked up six months in advance. Then we'd have nobody because they get better and they don't have to come back. It's the worst business model, you know, yes. but for people listening, we really are here to educate and empower people so they can take charge of their health care. At this pandemic experience, wouldn't it be nice if you felt like you had some power in this whole thing? You do. You have a lot of power with your health. And yes. that's, I think, part of what's going on in the world at this point. And I'd like to show you this uh, homotoxicology chart because it works in with the pleomorphism experience also. Um, I'll bring this up real quick. And yeah, the goal, the goal of the physician should be to discharge the client. Yes. You know, and unfortunately we've seen the last bunch of years because medicine is so heavily regulated in the United States that even the alternative method and the homeopathic, you know, method these days has, has kind of fallen, we call it a green allopath model. Mm. So you're going and instead of the pharmaceuticals, you're getting a bunch of herbs for, for each symptom, each leaf on the tree, right. you know, and, and the herbs can be complementary. That's for sure. But if you have to take those herbs every day for the rest of your life, then what's the, what's the point? You know, it's really hard for people to make this shift. I mean, I, you know, almost all of my clients come to me and they, you know, are taking 10 or 15, sometimes different supplements, you know, including botanicals and vitamins and things yeah. like that. And, uh, you know, every time I say, well, why are you taking this? And, uh, you know, nine out of 10 times, oh, I heard it was good. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Right. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google. They're very complimentary supplements. You know, they don't, they don't get to the root cause. And what we've seen too, working with so many people, um, people talk about the root cause. We're going to call this the true root cause at this point. Yeah. The supplements are not fixing your root cause. If I offend somebody out there that's using the supplements, I apologize. I'm not here to convince people or be convinced. I'm here to share information from our experiences. No, oh, no, it's the same <laughs> my experience. It's a rare very rare circumstance where someone has a specific deficiency that's corrected just by a supplement, right? That does happen, right. but it's yep. very uncommon. Yep. <laughs> you got it. Absolutely. You got it. Well, and if you look at the chart here, so this is, this is the progression of disease, okay? You have excretion, inflammation, deposition, impregnation, degeneration, and dedifferentiation. Now, excretion is the first part. This is normal. So if we look at the organ system of skin, everyone has episodes of sweating. Some people sweat more than others. Me, myself, I don't know what was going on with me growing up. But it was a little toxic, I guess, and the sweating was amazing. Wow, I'd go dancing and no one wanted to dance with me. <laughs> so, so it's gross. So what do we do? We do antiperspirant. Okay, not cool because your body's trying to excrete and push things out. So now things get pushed deeper into the body. Now we get into inflammation. Inflammation is how we heal. Trapped inflammation is when we have a problem. Okay, these first two are bacterial in nature. So things come in the blood and your acne happens here. It's trying to push things out now. Right. The way this chart works though is top left to bottom right. So if we start with sweating here, the acne may be what happens next depending on the person, wherever they have weakness. Okay, it could come out as a urinary tract infection. Don't know. What happens though is this, we do something for the excretion, sweating is gross, Let's say we get acne, we don't like that, so we put on the acne cream, so we push things deeper. Now all of a sudden, hmm, gout, okay, that's weird, coronary heart disease, exotosis, this is where things are depositing into the body. Kidney stones, it depends on the person. The body can't get it out, it deposits it somewhere where the body is weak. And this is all that left side, the humoral phase is all the bacteria, is the bacterial stage. So uh, acute disease is bacterial in nature, and a chronic disease is fungal in nature. So yes. as the disease goes, it gets pushed deep, deeper down into the body. Right. So, so that, now I'm, you're saying that the initial cause of the sweating would be some toxin the body's trying to remove? Yeah. yeah. Right. So does the nature of the particular toxin also determine, like, which system it affects? For it's, example, it's a good question. Yeah. often have a propensity towards the central nervous system. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it's interesting because dad would go out and he would always greet the client first and shake their hand. And he said if their hands were sweaty, he knew the person was in sympathetic mode. Right. So you, you could see just what you're kind of saying there that the nervous system is kind of tweaked to begin with. So I could see it being very common for it to affect the nervous system first like that. Right. Yeah. And it would seem to me too, yeah, if you've got, this is just the organ system. So if you've got some type of toxicity, um, you know, skin is the most common for us. So that's why I go there first, definitely. Heartburn, people get heartburn all the time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, body's trying to do something. It's trying to push something out. Um, it's funny, even coughing. What do we do with a cough? We take a cough drop. Right. Come on, the body's trying to get it out, you know? It's like diarrhea, we'll let it out. <laughs> it's mildly discomforting, you know, we just can't tolerate it in our modern culture. Yeah. 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 Right. No, yeah. that's it's we need to relax a little bit. This is, you know, this does make sense, and there have been two Nobel Prizes with work done based on this chart. So for people listening, this is not pseudoscience. Okay. It may actually hit a few buttons with people. But as you see here, once you get deposition things become bacterial. Something's stuck in the body, the body can't get it out. Typically... And it becomes fungal? Yes. It, yes. When it crosses the biological division, it becomes a fungus now. I see. Yeah. yeah. So now here too, this is where we start to get our allergies. We all have allergies, okay? The heart failure, the rheumatoid arthritis, and things like that. Now in the United States, they say the average American is on uh, three to five pharmaceuticals. Okay, what we see here is with excretion, well, let's take something not natural to prevent the body from doing what it's doing. Then acne, basically this is one pharmaceutical, two pharmaceuticals, three pharmaceuticals, you're pushing it deeper. At the end, you get to this point of de-differentiation de where the cells are breaking down. This is cancer. This is natural. It's a mold. It should happen while you're in the coffin, in the ground, not while you're alive. Now, what dad did, though, is as he's working with cancer patients, he looks at the blood, he sees blocks that are physical, energetic, emotional, he addresses the blocks, and then things start to come back to where they started. So you may see old symptoms popping up, maybe not, but this is where you're going back. Dad would say everything starts with an itch and ends with an itch. So to us, it makes sense. If you're on one, two, three, four, five pharmaceuticals, the next thing is cancer. It's a, and, it's and you know that the body's always the body's always striving for homeostasis. The body's always striving for balance. You know, and these days I see a lot of the history forms what I call a bullshit diagnosis. <laughs> right? You know, dad always says the name of the game is the name. As soon as they have a name for it, there's a drug for it, basically. Yeah. So for us, it's either going to be your circulatory cancer or arthritic. Those are the three conditions we're looking for. Yeah. Everything these days is autoimmune. Which, if <laughs> yeah. we look at the way the body heals. It's never going to attack itself, right? right. There's, just, there's no such thing as autoimmune. They, you know, basically, we always said that the doctor will call it autoimmune when they don't know what's wrong with you, so it must be your fault. <laughs> right. Yeah, there are several words for, that they have for that in medicine. Like My favorite is the idiopathic. Mm -hmm. Idiopathic, nice. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's really sad. You know, we've had people who are diagnosed with angry back syndrome. Yeah. You know, or crunchy neck syndrome. Yeah. Um, everything's a syndrome, <laughs> you know, basically. Like, yeah. uh, you know, that's the one they made quite a bit of money off of. Which, Which one? one? Restless leg syndrome. Oh, yeah. Totally. And the, the side effects for those drugs were, were comical. Like, you almost <laughs> wondered what the actual testing was. It sounded like they had a really good time on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excessive gambling and unusual sexual urges we saw. It's like, okay. Yeah, hmm. that was I mean, <laughs> increased gambling urges and unusual sexual urges with, with, with the restless leg syndrome. Oh. <laughs> drug. So, yeah, it makes you wonder a little bit, you know, but we look at it, you know, Lyme's this is a big deal these days, you know, and it's not autoimmune. Yeah. Right. It does not come from a spirochete. Right. The spirochete is created in your own body as a way to clean up the terrain. Right. Right. So they're saying you're getting bit by this tick. You know, most of our clients, clients never saw a tick in their life. You know, so it's just 10 and years ago. They never, uh, they never show um, a spirochete in someone's body. Mm. No. Either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's interesting. Even the Koch's postulate experience, they can't take it from a rat and give it to another rat. You know, they've it's, never it's, shown it's transmittable. We, you know, dad always said 15 years ago, they called it Epstein Barr, you know, and now they call it Limes. It's the same bull. They're looking for something to blame it on. Yeah. yeah. So they're telling I mean, it's your your fault. They don't know what's going on, so it's your fault. You know, well, we've seen people lose a lot of hope over it, which is sad. Right. So it seems like you know they 
pretty much don't know the cause of almost all illness right now. <laughs> and they don't know the cause of cancer, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, right? Diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. The, the only thing they do know the cause is when it's a germ that like, you know, comes from the uh, hinterland and invades us out of the blue, right? Only to uh, right. cause our demise, right? And we need right. to put in the right coat to, uh, to rescue us. Yeah. But, yeah. but, all these other illnesses that they say they don't know what it cause, causes them, they still are looking for a virus or a bacteria as the culprit, right? right? Like the never-ending search, even though none of the research uh, reveals yeah. evidence of that. No, it's no, like why? No, in, in the 20th century, traditional medicine didn't find the cause or the cure of one chronic disease. Yeah, Not infectious, but chronic disease. So they were a total 100-year failure, basically. So, you know, dad always says, now you take your car to the mechanic for a transmission. And they say, well, I never fixed the transmission before. <laughs> Are you going to leave your car there? Are right. you going to take their expert opinion on things? It's not, you know, their experts on nothing, unfortunately, at this point in time. It's, it's been a proven failure. So yeah. and if you're a physician and you're in the field of healing, you should be looking at things that are actually helping people. Well, the, the first time that I ever, uh, you know, knew of a client that I ever worked with in any capacity that was cured of an illness was once I stepped out of medicine. <laughs> of <Alabama. laughs> right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Huh? It's actually, yeah. the first time I ever tried it, I had read Kelly Brogan's book, uh, where she had adapted some uh, nutritional protocols from Nicholas Gonzalez, who you might know of was very oh, yes. also yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And, um, you know, and worked with someone that I, I you know, it was like a, a colleague that I had worked with at a previous uh, a location and, uh, and just cured of an anxiety condition that, uh, you know, had haunted her for probably 15 or 20 years. And that's oh, the first, first and only time I've seen, you know, any anxiety condition cured like that. I haven't had another client come to me yet uh, with that similar kind of issue. But, you know, like since then, that's pretty much what I've seen is, anyone that put the effort into addressing the root cause problem and was willing to change their lifestyle around got better. If not, I mean, most of them a hundred percent better, but if not that like way better. Yeah. They yeah. have to play a part in the healing process. And it's interesting when we look at the blood and we see the activity, you know, sometimes there's too many somatids in the blood. Sometimes there's not enough. So you want a nice happy balance. But we always looked at the somatids. It, this is what's going on internally. So people would come up with a snowstorm in their blood, right? Too much activity. And that's what's going on internally with them. So they're full of anxiety, yeah. right? There's a lot of people who are electromagnetically sensitive. And sometimes people are just crazy. But a lot of times people are more sensitive to those electromagnetic frequencies. And we look at the activity in our body as our own electromagnetic frequency. And every client we had who, who was really sensitive to those frequencies had a snowstorm in their blood all, all the time. Right. So the body was working 24 hours a day, seven days a week trying to heal. And as you figure out what the cause is, the body calms down, goes into parasympathetic, and then those sensitivities go away. It was a really a nice, easy way to monitor it. It's the same with the root canals. The body is trying to work on this dead tooth, and we see all this activity in the blood because the body is trying to heal it. And the body is not going to give up on you. It's going to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week until it gets tired right. and starts to break down. Right. Well, this is uh, like really an amazing discussion. I know we could get into a lot more uh, detail about it, but I understand that you guys have some ideas or a vision about how to kind of support terrain theory being, you know, more and more integrated. And, and hopefully, like, you know, my goal is to have it be the predominant paradigm, paradigm in healing. So uh, can you tell us about some efforts or you know, things that you're doing along those lines? Uh, um, sure. What are your goals? Sure. It's interesting because, you know, Dad, Dad did a lot of things. He created the uh, Arizona Holistic Medical Practice Act and separated the Holistic Medical Association from the AMA. He gave out the first holistic medical licenses in the United States. He created a law and he changed medicine. And AMA wasn't happy about that. Um, he saved lives and it was wonderful. And he fought. Now, Josh and I are not here to fight with people. We're here to share information. My goal was to share this knowledge so it did not die with our father. And, you know, I'm a music teacher. Josh, Josh just learned from dad. He didn't go to medical school. But at this point, you know, we've shared information online, um, Facebook, you know, when we were less censored and things like that. And people have reached out to us all around the world. So we went to Spain. We lectured. We have a microscope there. 
We've gone to England. There's a clinic there that would love us to go and incorporate our work there. Uh, I'm in Mexico right now. Uh, we just did an interview with someone in the Canary Islands. So our thought and idea is to get microscopes everywhere in the world because we have them hooked up through the internet. Um, right now, as I'm in Mexico, I get the images and Josh is near Sacramento and he does the report. He can actually see the microscope in real time. So we're looking to partner with people. And you said earlier, there's a lot of different modalities. There's different roads to the same place. So when we say body work, the, blood, the structure needs to be addressed. There's a lot of different types of body workers. So our work is complementary. We're here to support people doing good work. If you're a practitioner and you want some insight, you've got someone you're not sure what's going on, one drop of blood will give you a totally unique insight, then you do your thing. Now, the blood will change immediately after a treatment if the treatment is effective. So we look at the blood, we see structure, we get you to the right person, and they do the right work, and the blood will change. If we get you to a person who does work that makes you feel good and the blood didn't change, we know that that person did not get to the root cause of the issue. So we want to work with practitioners that are doing body work. We want to do more with scar treatment and therapies. And we want to get blood from people all around the world in order to support what they're doing, where they're at. We have our online database that's being set up right now for a more user-friendly interface. So we can get people access. So for example, you can get access to our database and you can start to surf our images and start to see the patterns of disease as far as our database was able to figure things out. We saw, what was it, Josh, the, uh, uh, with the IUDs? Oh, yeah, two, two, two thirds of our ovarian cancer cases had IUDs in at one point in time. Wow. So the risk of breast cancer went down, although they just disproved that, but ovarian cancer skyrocketed with it. And that's way more of a difficult case to take care of than breast cancer is. Yes, right now. So we're using this database and these images to map the patterns of disease as well as evaluate therapies that are effective for different issues in different people and people are different so what works for me might not work for you i love the osteopathic experience maybe you want to go see someone who does raw thing or something else there's a lot of people out there you know but that's our goal right now is we want to set up an international research network um, without walls so we can experience what other people are doing and support people around the world uh, mexico is awesome because they're very supportive the doctors here are great and we've worked dad worked with them in the 90s so we know they're good um, and we know there's other people out there too doing interviews with people like you and connecting people I think is super important right now. And we're happy to work with anybody who does not have an ego. <laughs> 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 so we're very confident what we do, but this is, it's not a challenge. It's, it's not a race. We're looking to collaborate with people. And I was raised to be honest about what I know and honest about what I don't know. So, yeah. you well, know, that's very important. Uh, not too many doctors can, uh, can live up to that. But, um, you know, this sounds like a really a fantastic project. And uh, I really wish that I worked with people in my area. And maybe in the future, there'll be enough people in my area to, uh, you know, create demand. Uh, and then I'll be uh, first in line to uh, try to get one of these microscopes. We but, know some people in your area. We could introduce you to a few people. Oh, that would, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> we know a few people, yes. And we just really want to share. You know, it's really exciting. I feel that this community has been divided and conquered over time. So pandemic is forcing people to figure certain things out. And our community is starting to regroup. You know, and I think this is awesome. There's stuff going on behind the scenes. We're building bridges. And as the world gets pulled back, I think we're going to have a real solid infrastructure with answers that make sense. Right. Well, you can see that people are uh, losing trust in the healthcare system because of this medical martial law. And they, you know, many people can see all of the ridiculous um, contradictions in what's going on and, and realize that actually, you know, most of the people that uh, perished in the, you know, spike phase of this um, pandemic were from medical practice and oh, yes. medical yeah. procedures and mismanagement and, you know, not from any other cause. Yeah. But um, so I, uh, it was really great uh, talking with you guys about this. I, uh, I think we definitely need to do this again in the future because mm -hmm. there's several topics we couldn't get to, but um, you guys have your own radio show too. And why don't you just tell the viewers like where they can find you and, uh, and, sure. your show and et cetera. 
Yeah, we have our website, which is thebigelsonmethod.com. If you type up our name, Bigelson, B-I-G-E-L-S-E-N, you'll find our dad on Coast to Coast with George Norrie. He's on Gaia TV, um, season two, episode one, and another episode. Uh, he's on Quack Watch, which is where all the best doctors are. Um, I'll, I'll leave Quack Watch in the show notes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if you do, it's funny. If you go there, we have nothing to hide. Uh, at the end of Quack Watch, you'll see my name in there talking about what we've done and there's actually a link to our website and we get business from quack watch wow that's excellent <laughs> <laughs> yes we're not here to fight we're here to make friends um but we i've been doing my blood diaries show um i haven't done it a bit because of the move to mexico and because facebook has been so toxic you know um so i'm going to be doing the shows again within the next few weeks now that i'm grounding here um so i want to interview people and connect people with people um, you know, I was able to connect you with Mishiko, which is great, Dr. Emoto's person, and they'll get an article of your stuff into Japan, and to connect you with Anna Maria in Spain. Um, you know, we want to share all this stuff with people around the world as best as possible. The Facebook show I do, if you just go to Bigelson Academy is what our Facebook page is. Um, and aside from that, it's, it's really time for us to get a team going. You know, we need people to work with. Um, and anytime you want to have us on, we're thrilled. Um, we have some awesome pictures. I don't know if you want to let us show a picture or two real quick at the end for your viewers to see some of these interesting images. Did you get a chance to see some of our images? And yeah, well, you can put up a, a couple if you like. Okay, we'll do a couple real quick. Okay. Um, Josh, was there anything you wanted to uh, talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, for years, I was just, Dad always talked about we were the rat in the wheel. So that's all we were doing is microscope and clients and microscope and clients so now with, without clinics i'm so much happier and we can start to do more research right so we can do more research we could do more collaboration um the collaboration over the last couple of years i had with a lot of the alternative community frankly was a little frustrating it made me appreciate you know the simplicity of what my father did and and, and i saw firsthand how the alternative community is going more towards the supplement phase and kind of missing the forest for the trees uh, but then, like when we were in Spain, there's other practitioners coming out of the woodwork who really start to get it. Yeah. So right now, like I said, we're just there to educate. You know, I've, I've got a lot of experience. So all I'm doing is talking to people about my experiences. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a lot funner. But it's, it all, it's all really simple. Adam will probably show you pictures of organs and things like that in the blood. I'm kind of in the minority where I never think the organ is the primary cause of your issue. There's always a reason the organ isn't working properly. Right. You know, yeah. so maybe if we take the, the diaphragm off the liver, the liver will process a little better. You know, so s simple things like that. But if, if people can start to grasp the simplicity of health, um, then things will be a lot simpler for them. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't your listeners, wouldn't you like life to be a little more simple as far as your health was concerned? It, it, it should be. It would, yes, we need to have more simplicity right now. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's ironic we use a microscope to get people to come out of the rabbit hole. Um, so this person broke his hand, not that you can tell from that picture, but here's the picture in the blood. Wow. So you're seeing, you're seeing his hand. This is the body saying, this is a problem. I need this dealt with. Um, and these days we're just trying to work as a laboratory. Send us some blood. We'll tell you what we think. Here's a knee in the anatomy book. And there's, that's actually my knee in the blood. This is just an air pocket right there on the side. Um, here's an x-ray. And this on the left side, those are air pockets, but you can see the cartilage here and the vertebrae and everything. Western medicine says this is dirt. We have dirt that matches anatomy books. <laughs> and this will show up in every drop of your blood until the issue gets dealt with. So this is basically just telling you that there is some kind of pathology at this anatomical site? Is that simply, yes, yeah, simply enough, every all matter vibrates at different frequency. In the body, organs, different tissue, they vibrate a different frequency. If something is out of balance, it creates a disturbance field or interference field. And holograms are created by taking an image of an interference field. Our microscope bounces the light, which is the way holograms are made. This is energy bouncing off whatever is going on in your body that shouldn't be going on. And we can visually see it the same way bats and dolphins are using echolocation. And it's match, I mean, they're matching the books, you know, and we see emotions which we can talk about a little bit at another time, definitely. But the colon, I mean, this person, we could actually tell they still had to go to the bathroom. You know, it's, I mean, the cervix, poor women have been butchered by doctors because they've been men. You know, doctors have been men historically, and so many of the women issues are created by doctors. 
we feel for them. The cervical issues, cervix issues, we see this often in the blood. The lung associated with grief. My pneumonia wouldn't go away until I dealt with my grief. Um, the kidney. This is the most perfect image of a kidney I've ever seen in the blood. And this guy came to us. Why? What's that? He said it even shows the blood supply. It's amazing. I mean, it's really, this person came to us with so much fear and anxiety. We looked at the blood. We said kidney, which is the organ of fear and anxiety as far as Chinese medicine is concerned. We said kidney problems. He said he was born with one of his kidneys atrophied. So this person thinks he's crazy, but the reality is his system has been compromised. So he needs to learn some tools to help him with his fear and anxiety. I mean, you can't fix a dead kidney if it was dead from the beginning. And there's people out there who use a similar microscope when they call it live, live blood cell analysis. And they'll say a lot of these things we see are artifacts. Um, we had very different training from live cell analysis. So for people out there who, who've had dark field microscopy done, if they haven't had it from us, they really haven't had you know what we do. So we're really strong in letting people know that we don't like to be compared or aligned in any way with what's going on with the live cell movement because they're talking about bacterias and candidas and parasites. And a lot of their actual insights are incorrect, unfortunately. Um, so we try to distance ourselves from live blood cell analysis. Yeah. And uh, one last one I'll show you real quick, which I thought was a cool one. We have so many bizarrely interesting images. Is a good one. <laughs> um, well, this one I like because this one, this was a woman that worked for us and she was ice skating and fell and hit her head on the ice. And she went to the hospital and they said she was fine. She came to us. We looked at her blood and this to us is, is the spine and this is the head. So we looked at this and we said, we think you're hemorrhaging. And we sent her back to the hospital and they tested her and they said, oh yeah, you are hemorrhaging. So we caught it in the, in the blood after all their technology missed it. Okay. And was it, was it in the same anatomic location as this and like in the brainstem? Oh, oh yeah. Wow. Usually that would uh, cause death. <laughs> she was, she was, she was not in a good spot, you know, and it was amazing to us that, you know, there was something going on there and the body said, help. You know, I mean, that's what she did. She went to the hospital and she came right to us right after that. Yeah, so, I'm surprised. Initially, the hospital didn't do any, any scans on her. So mm -hmm. we just told her to go back because the brain looked really irritated at that point in time. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's the amount of issues we have or images that match the books. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to question these. You can if you want, but, you know, dad got results based on what he was seeing. Here's a sonogram. You can see the, the baby in the blood. We used to tell people whether it was a boy or a girl. This one's six months pregnant. It's so wait, previous one, was that a boy image? Which one? Well, this one? Oh, that's funny. Kind of looks that way from this point of view. Uh, I don't know. He <laughs> could be a proud dad. Boy. I thought that could be the cord at first, but then after you said that, I was like, uh, that's a healthy boy. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah very healthy. <laughs> yeah, we, we really, we just enjoy sharing the stuff, you know, the things we've seen and the things that people are trying to find out about. And we just want to help. You know, we want to share information. It's not us, Dad would say. It's not me. It's the blood. It makes our it makes things easy. It actually takes our brain out of the equation. We take a drop of your blood, and your body tells us what it needs. And he but, says, uh, the health is, is so simple that even I can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I'm really blown away. I'm glad you uh, showed those images. Um, you know, I definitely uh, want to learn more about this. And uh, once again, thank you guys for taking the time to talk with me today. And uh, just to remind everyone that we'll, I'll have links below in the show notes um, for all of the uh, contact information as well as for my website in case you're interested in a consultation. And um, thank you so much for watching. And uh, please hit the like and subscribe button. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. You K. Good to see you.